Good morning, New Beginning Church and our online family and friends. We welcome you to the New Beginning Church. Uh, we're glad to be in service one more time. Please join us in our in our service.
you will discover these words. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, right. but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of, of faith. All right. I want to talk about evidence of transformation. All right, all right. My focus today is verse number three. And my focus is verse number three where we must all consider ourselves at the foot of Jesus. My focus is verse number three because we ought not consider ourselves a highly, more highly than we ought to. Because it's God who has given to every man a measure of faith. Yes, Evidence of transformation. Follow me to the courtroom scene. When the judge calls the prosecutor up and says, who do you call to the witness stand? He calls your name or she calls your name. You take the witness stand. And the prosecutor began to question you. And he or she is probing you for evidence. Uh -huh. 
You may have or you may not have been an eyewitness, but you have come and been called as well as subpoenaed to this courtroom scene because you are you are in possession of evidence. Yeah, right. Evidence to a crime, evidence to situations, evidence to previous crimes that have taken place. Uh -huh. And so here you are on the witness stand, the prosecutor goes through to tear you apart, and after the prosecutor finishes his questioning or her questioning, then your defense attorney steps up. <laughs> And he begins to question you along the same lines that the prosecutor has questioned you. And your defense attorney already knows that you are guilty, but it's his job, it is his job to prove that you have been set free. It is his job to prove that even though you're guilty, even though you have fallen short, even though you messed up, even though you messed up by omission or commission, it is the it is the defense attorney to plead your case All on right. your behalf. All right. All right. I'm talking about evidence of, of transformation. And the defense attorney does not argue that you're guilty. He does not argue that you you have not been guilty of what has whatever you've been accused of. The defense attorney does not argue whether or not you are guilty as charged, but he is there to present evidence of your transformation. Yeah. In other words, in other, in other words, yeah, you're guilty. Yeah, you messed up. Yeah, you fallen short. Yeah, you intentionally, recklessly did it, and you did it because you wanted to do it on your own. But it is the job of my defense attorney to stand, sit me on, on the witness stand and to make sure I present evidence so he can present further evidence that there have been transformation. That he doesn't question anybody else. He doesn't bring another person alongside. He just questioned me on what I have done. Let me just tell you, as I stop by here on my way to the rapture, to let you know, you can't testify of your goodness and somebody else's goodness. you got to testify of your wrong so God can find you guilty and your defense attorney can plead your case and, and plead your case on your behalf. When we look at the text, we find the Apostle Paul writing, and when I read this text, some of you said, oh, I know this like the back of my hand. I, I, I can recite this one. As a matter of fact, I can recite it in the King James Version, and, and he's reading King, New King James Version. I just want to tell you that God speaks to me every time I read it. And he speaks to me in a different way. And that's what God does when we are in a, in a mood and when we're in a particular place in, in our lives. God can speak to us while we're in that place. Yeah, when, when, when I was in the other place, he spoke to me through this word. And then he can use the same word and speak to you in this new place. Evidence of transformation. The word transformation means that you have taken on a change. It is like it is like the, the butterfly. He didn't start off as a butterfly. He has to go through some stuff. And when the butterfly goes through some things, it's not an easy going through. And he has to wrestle his way out. He, he has to move that cocoon. He, he, he shows up as an unattractive thing. And then he becomes beautiful with lots of beautiful colors. If you were to testify today, if you've been with, walking with the Lord just two minutes, if you've been walking with the Lord, your testimony ought to be, I'm not what I used to be. Right. I'm not what I'm going to be. Right. But thank God I am not what I used to be. Right. Because God has a way of blessing us in spite of us, in spite of our condition and our meanness, in spite of all that we go through, God blesses us. Right. We're not here today because we deserve to be here. We are not here today because we are so holy. We are not here today because we got up on our own this morning. We are here today because of God's amazing grace. His mercy in his grace has come our way. Because justice was pulling on our line this morning. Justice was pulling on our heart this morning. Justice was saying, you don't deserve to be here. And every time justice showed up, God shut justice down and gave us grace. Gave us mercy. Gave us one more chance to get it right with him. So the Apostle Paul pins this letter and he says to us, I beseech you, brother. He says, I beg of you. I, I urge you. I exhort you. I encourage you. I appeal to you, my brother. I, I ask 
ask of you, I beg of you, I appeal to you, I beseech you, my brother, I, I exhort you today, my brother, whatever you do, hear me. Apostle Paul, he begs. The Apostle Paul struggles with mankind to just get it right with God. I come before you this morning to beg you, to appeal to you, to encourage you. I come this morning to, to urge you. He says, I beg of you, I urge of you, brethren, that you, by the mercies of God, he says, I am coming to you by God's compassion. You do know if it had not been for God's compassion, we would not be here. If it had not been for God's love toward us, we would not be here. And let me tell you, it's not because of who you are, not because where you go to church, it's not because of your church attendance, because if it was because of our church attendance, oh, we must be out of here. It's not because we've been so good, it's not because we have not struggled with stuff, it's only because of God's mercy, God's grace, it's because of God's compassion that we have. It's not because of anything we've done. But this word mercy means it's, it's what God has already done. He did it for you over 2,000 years ago. He, he did it for you. He gave you compassion. By the mercies of God. God has given you mercy. God, God, the, the Theos God. God, God, the, the God who, who is the supreme being. God, who is the creator himself. God, the divine one, has given us another chance. And when he gives us another chance, we ought to appreciate the chance. When he gives us, let me tell you, he didn't give me a second chance. I burned that one a long time ago. He's given me another chance. And because he's given me another chance, I need to give him back all that he has given us. Folk get caught up. Folk get caught up. People get caught up on being holy. And they get caught up with being holy, but their purse and their pocketbooks are not holy. Oh, God, you, you got me, Lord. I, I would sing your little songs. I, I would shout when they hit the right tune. I would even say amen to the preacher. But when the offering comes, I don't clap like they clap. I don't rejoice like they rejoice. And God is looking forward to a cheerful giver. And let me tell you, I just stopped by to tell you that 10% is nothing compared to 90% that you get. It's nothing, it's nothing, it's nothing, it's nothing. It's nothing. It's nothing. And we trust leading people. We are calling ourselves leaders of people. And we can't do just that little bit that God has asked us to do. We cut, we dark, we hide, we, we, we negotiate whether we do, do, the, do the, the net or the gross. Let me what, just ask you a question. Do you want a, a net blessing or a gross blessing? Do you want favor from God on your net or on your gross? Don't let stuff stop you from walking closer with God. Don't let your possessions, don't let your offering cut a short circuit your blessings with God. He right. says, God has given us mercy, given us compassion, given us favor, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice. You see, biblically, when they were talking about sacrifices, they were talking about doves being cut up and killed. They would talk about goats and bullocks, and, and they would talk about dying sacrifices. But since Jesus has come and given his life, we no longer have to realize or no longer have to come in contact with dead sacrifices because the fact of the matter is the ultimate sacrifice has already been given. His name is Jesus. So Paul invade, invites us. He invades our, our space. That's the word that we use now in this, while I'm in this space. Meaning while I'm in this mindset, while I'm going through, and while I'm, I'm, I'm rejoicing in what God is doing with me, while I'm in this space, God is saying, while we are in this space, God wants us to be living sacrifices. He wants you to keep on living. He, he wants you to live with power. He wants you to live with exuberance. He wants you to live with excitement. The word sacrifice simply means commitment. He wants your commitment. He wants your commitment and worship. He wants your commitment and offering. He wants your commitment in your stuff. He wants you to be a living sacrifice. He wants you to keep living. He wants you to be a godly example. He wants you to be a godly example for other men to see and for children to follow. The problem is, just 
just as it was in Paul's day, we are confusing children, saying we are Christians, saying we are Christians, saying we are born again, and they see five sides of us. He, they, see, they see us one way on Sunday. They see us a different way on Monday. And then we don't wait to Friday and Saturday to get here. They show sure not see us differently. They see five different people in one. And let me just share with you. You're not five people. You're just one. And God wants you to be a living, holy example of him. He says it right here. He says a living sacrifice. A living commitment. And he goes on to explain it. He says holy. He wants you sacred. He wants you different. He wants you set apart. He wants you holy. And, and, and when he talks about you being different, the difference is not comparing yourself to anybody else. The difference is that you're different today than you were yesterday. It ought not take six months. It ought not take three months for you to be different. God is working on us. We ought to let him work on us. Jeremiah gives the example of a, of a, of a, of a, a lump of clay on wheel. Jeremiah says that I'm nothing but the clay, and God is the clay handler. Yes. God, I am the vessel of clay. And Paul goes on to say that we are living epistles, living vessels for God to see mm. and for God to work on us. You ought to be telling God in the midst of your trouble, work on me, Lord. Change my heart. Change my mind. Work on me, Lord. You ought to be giving it up for the Lord and, and allowing God to work on you because you've been trying to work on you. That's why I'm doing the invitation. I say to people, don't wait till you get it right to come to the Lord. You need to make sure that you get it to the Lord and he can get it right for you. Twelve steps won't do it. You got to give it to the Lord. Five steps and a preacher won't do it. You got to give it to the Lord. Trying it on your own. Talking about I'm going to beat it all by myself. You've already tried that 12 times and you have not been able to beat it. You need to give it to the Lord. Yeah. 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 You need to be like the Indian chief. Indian chief went to the revival one night. The first night he got there, the preacher preached the word of God and he came down the aisle. He said, me Indian chief. Me steady one no more. I'm going to give up my, my, my axe right now. I'm giving up my tomahawk right now. Me steady one no more. I didn't change. The next night in revival, him and Chiefs came down the aisle. He said, me give my headpiece. I give my headpiece today because I no longer lead people into war anymore. I want to be, I want the, the king of kings to lead me and so I can follow him. The third night of the revival, the Indian chief came down the aisle, took his whole self, his whole body, and laid it and prostrate on the altar. He said, Lord, I don't give my, my tomahawk anymore. I don't give my headpiece anymore. I give my whole self now. I give my whole self. We need to follow the example of the, of the chief and give our whole self to the God that we serve. He says we need to be holy. We need to be different. And don't compare yourself to anybody else. All right. You know, we we in church, we, we, we're good at comparing folks. When the wrong, wrong person walks in the room, that we deem the wrong person, the person walks in that, that have not had adequate shower, have not had the right haircut, have not had not dressed the right way, we can look down our nose at them. But let me tell you, if you can still look down your nose at them, your inner man is dressed just like their person. Your inner self is messed up. Yeah, yeah. We have to understand that if it had not been for the Lord, right. if it had not been for the Lord on our side, we would have been the same way. Every time I see a man walking down the street and he's shaking his head and looking up toward the sky and, and talking to himself, I said, there, if it had not been for God's amazing grace, there I would have gone. Yeah. Right. We were a young man that grew up with us. We we were in boxing, and, and we grew up together, and he was a championship boxer. Well. I mean, he was short, and he was fast, and he could throw hands. He, he's the one that created that song, uh, Don't Try, You Better Try Jesus and Not Me Because I Throw Hands. <laughs> and every time I go home, I used to see him walking the street. 
He didn't really look like himself, but I could tell that he was the young man that used to box. He was he was fast. He he was quiet, and he could punch and punch. And he's walking down the street, limping, talking to himself, chasing dogs, and you can tell he's out of his mind. And he was deemed to be number one coming out of the city. But he took a sniff of this. A snort of that and lost his mind. It's, it's because if it had not been for God's amazing grace, this same boy that I, I fellowship with, this same boy that I sparred with, the same boy that I traveled with, he could have been me and I could have been him. But it's because of God's mercy and God's grace. And we don't know why God gives us another chance. Because he chooses to give other folk other chances and chooses not to give some folk other chances. But you don't know how many chances God has already given us. So we have to make sure that we position ourselves for God's favor. Yeah. Yeah. We, we want to be living examples, living, living epistles, living godly examples for young folk to follow. Where they can say, where they can say, well, I saw them do this. One thing growing up, the deacons at our church back home, I wanted to be like them. I, I never wanted to be a preacher. I mean, I saw what the preachers went through. I saw the folk giving preachers hell. And I come to the conclusion I didn't want any part of that. I saw the pedestal that some people put the preachers on, and I didn't want to be any part of that. And then I saw some of the pedestals that the preachers put themselves on. I didn't want to be part of that. But I love the way that deacons served back home. They didn't complain. They served. And they taught young men how to serve. And they spent time with other people. And they looked for opportunities to serve. Those days, Brother Deacon Alvin, may be over now. So I always wanted to be, I wanted to be a deacon because I thought those deacons, they were living sacrifices and they were holy unto the Lord. From the eldest statesman to the youngest man. I just enjoyed watching them. I, I would just position myself to watch them. I would ask them questions and, and they would tell me why they did what they did. And every time they answered the question, it was because of my love for the Lord. And they would, re they would return the answer and say, the boy, over 2,000 years ago, he gave his life. He gave his very best for me. And because he gave his very best for me, now I'm going to give him my very best. Amen. He says, be holy, be different, be set apart, and be acceptable. This word acceptable means that, that you ought to be pleasing to God. Matter of fact, you ought to be well-pleasing to God. He, 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 he closes this, this third verse out by talking about faith. And it is impossible to please God without faith. You know, all it takes is two drops of rain. It'll cancel the trip to church for 20, for, for 20 Christians. Two, two drops. Two, matter of fact, it doesn't take any drops anymore. All it needs is a Thursday four class. The Thursday four cast says that it's going to drop. It's 20% chance rate. Oh, it's 20% chance. And you don't realize that it's 80% of a chance it won't rain. And you know God is a keeper. He can keep you in the rain. He can keep you in the storm. Let me tell you, your house didn't keep you in the last storm that came by. It was God that kept you. Your house, your car didn't keep you on the road the last time you got stuck out there. It was God that kept you. And if God can keep you in the midst of storm and rain, he can keep you when the sun is shining. That's right. That's right. That's right. Be pleasing, be acceptable unto God, the, which is your reasonable service. Reasonable, reasonable, reasonable is a rational thing. And it's a spiritual thing. Let me just share with you. Many times, we don't think that that which is rational can also be spiritual. You know, we have people all over the world that talk about, I'm going to go and pray about it, and they come back with the same answer they had before they prayed. <laughs> they, they, made, they made up their own mind before they talked to the Lord. I think Christians sometimes use it as a cop-out. I'm going to go and pray about it. What you, uh, you can conclude right there based on who they are and what their character is, what they're going to do and what they're not going to do. Well, let me pray about it. I, I ask right away, what God's going to say? 
Because I already know, Brother Miles, what, what God is going to say. I already know what they're going to come back and tell me, God said. If there's something that they never wanted to do, that God's going to tell them don't do. If there's something they've been dying to do, God has already said, I've just been waiting on you to get a step up and do this. But when we talk to God, God, God's conversation ought to be a dialogue. When God talks to us and we talk to him and we listen to what he has to say. And guess what? God has the last word. Have you ever walked with God like that and you talk to him like you're walking with your girlfriend or your boyfriend, like, like you're walking with a family member where he speaks to you and he speaks to you in a way that you can hear him very well? Amen. And you know he's urging you, he's oxing you, he's encouraging you to go ahead and get it done? You have to walk with him, but you can't walk with him in the bad times if you haven't been walking with him in the good times. You have to create a relationship that is strengthened through your fellowship, and your fellowship is when God is there, you are there. And when, when God says move, you move just like that. But what we do, we get in trouble. I called my daughter the other day, and I hope she's listening. I asked the question. Do you only call me when you're in trouble? Do you only call me when there's an emergency? And guess what? This week I got four calls already. <laughs> and all I had to do, Brother Winslock, is ask the question. Every, is it every time you call me that the house is on fire? Is it every time you call me that life is, is going to come to an end if I don't rush there? That's how some Christians act with God. God has become a fire escape for us. And because he's our fire escape, you don't use the fire escape until there's a fire. And so we call on God when there's a fire. I said to the group that comes to Sunday school, that um, to Bible study, brother, I said to them that we need to understand that God gives us 24 hours in a day. And if we're going to tie 10% of our time to God, we ought to spend at least two and a half hours with the Lord. Mm -hmm. Either doing some mission work for Him or spending quiet time along with Him or being about His business or praying and talking to Him or listening to Him. We ought to spend two and a half hours. I don't care what your job looks like. That's right. I don't care what the demands of your life are. We have to make sure that we have quality time alone with the Lord. The scriptures that I send out every, every Monday, you ought to have quality time alone with those little seven verses. Because God is good to us. Let me tell you, I, I know I'm the only one in the room excited about it, but I'm excited that God is good to us. And he's not just good to me. He is good to all of us. He blesses us. And we can't afford to sleep at the wheel on God. Us in ourselves uh, and make it a reasonable service. It ought to be reasonable, acceptable. Which is your reasonable service? A reasonable, reasonable service means that, that, that it is practical, it is spiritual, and it is rational. And let me tell you, God is not a mystical God. Well, you gotta hear stuff clinging in the background. God is not a mystical God until you gotta you gotta make sure you go into some seance and talk to him in another language. The God we serve understands you very well. If you speak English, you can pray in English. And you will get a prayer through the God. If you speak Spanish, you can pray in Spanish and, and you can get a prayer through the God. If you're bilingual, you can pray in any language and, and he, you can get it through to God because God knows all and he sees all. That's why he is God. Wow, what a God we serve. And then he says, verse number two, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He says, don't take on the shape. Don't take on the figure. Don't take on the attitude of things of this world. Don't be like the world. Don't be like those who are not saved. Don't be like those in this cosmos. He says, make sure that people can determine who you are and whose you are. Right. You ever wonder why boys wear pants the way they, the way they do because they saw somebody else do? In my day, women wore earrings. Now, Michael Jordan got two of them. 
Do we do it because professionals do it? Do we do it because entertainers do it? Do we do it because rappers do it? Do we do it because the ballers and the shot callers do it? Let me tell you, make your own apparel and put your name in it and sell it for millions. Sell it for millions. Make sure that you make money and stop making other folk rich. Right. We have to teach our young people how to think on their own. There's a bunch of stuff out there that has not been discovered yet. That God is waiting on a young person just to put their mind to it to make it happen. All right. All right. Be reasonable. He says, be not conform. Don't take on the shape. Don't, don't take on the image. Don't, don't take on this, this form that the world has. But you be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be, be renewed. Be, be, be changed. Be transformed. You need to be changed, transformed morally and spiritually. Be changed in your character. Be transfigured. Be different. You can't afford to compare yourself to anybody else because they're worse than you are. There's no bragging rights in you comparing yourself to somebody else. Isaiah found that out. Isaiah said it was in the year that King Uzziah died that I also saw the Lord. And I saw him like never before. I saw him high and lifted up. His train filled the temple and the doorpost shook and moved. And when the doorpost shook and moved, I saw his train fill the temple. The glory of God was all in the room. And he says, oh, Lord, who am I? I'm, I'm undone. He says, first of all, I'm messed up. And then he looked around at the folk around him, his people, his, his hanging buddies, and he says, not only am I messed up, Lord, they messed up too. You see, if I was to compare myself to you, I have the tendency to say, I'm all right. But we can't compare ourselves to each other. We must compare ourselves to God. And if we compare ourselves to God, then we will never catch up. We will never be totally complete unless God steps in on our behalf. Right, right. So be we transformed be by the renewing. Renewing, it means to be new in. Of your mind, your apprehension, your your communication, your understanding, your mind. Make, make sure that you got a different understanding. Have you ever tried to talk to somebody with bad understanding? Yeah. Don't point, don't, don't look around. Yeah. Have you ever tried to just get something through to somebody with bad understanding? I mean, that their, their, their understanding is just bad. I mean, there's no way you can get through to them. And you can show it to them in black and white. You can show it to them in red and blue. You can show it to them visually. You can put a prop in front of them. If they got bad understanding, you know they're going to come to the same conclusion before you have been talking. It says that your mind ought to be renewed. You ought to be different. Your mind ought to be changed. Your mind ought to be transformed and transfigured. It ought to be made over. He says, says to us today, be transformed by the renewing of my mind that you may prove, meaning examine yourself. We too busy examining other folk. We too busy worried about other people's children and our children running amok. We too busy. See, we think, we think our children are just the darlings of the world. Let me tell you, Mama probably thought that about me too, but she, she I mean, she. I mean, Daddy probably thought that about me, but the first time they heard of something. And you know, I could not dispute any word that any of they any of them say. It didn't matter if they knew them. They were asking, they were asking a question like this, how old are you? They obey pain, oh you did. People could lie on you, and mommy and daddy will take their word, and then they'll say stuff like this. Well, if, if they're wrong this time, I'm getting you for old and new. We have to understand that there's a standard that must be set, and our minds must be renewed to build up the standard. Young girl, stop lowering your standards for some thug on the street. Regardless of, of what they usher in, if they say a man and a woman can't get together, but a woman and a man cannot get together, but a woman and a woman can, let me just share with you. Stop knowing your standards. All right. All right. All right. Stay with the word of God. Just because they, they usher in some things, just because they legislate in some things, don't you get caught up in it. 
stay with the word. I guarantee you, if you stay with the word 10 years from now, you will be saved. And people trying to wonder why drama is so caught up in same-sex marriage. Because you can't stick a plug on top of plug. You need a you need a male plug to go into a female plug. That's the only way you get electricity. We still trying to figure out why every time they get together with somebody else, it's the same old drama over and over again. Let me tell you, in order to put two pipes together, you need a couple that's a female and a pipe that's a that's a male in order for them to go together. We have to make sure we stop lowering our standards just because somebody else has a standard. And let me just hit it right here. Men got to be men that children can look up to. Men have to be men that children can respect and their wives can respect. Men, we have a great responsibility. It is our responsibility to show boys how to be men. But it's also our responsibility to show girls what to accept and what to expect in another man. If you show them what they can expect in another man, they are looking, let me just tell you, Daddy, they're looking for a man just like you. If you walk around here stuggy, they're looking for a thug. And no sense you crying later on, they're going to get what you present. And I just hope, I just hope that I'm presenting something to my children that God will be pleased with, which God will be an example in the midst of them. And if they go shady, they go going shady on their own or because of their environment. God is looking for women that will take care of their households. Women who will be, be humble and be of sound mind. Women were not made to be doormats. I think I said it again. Women were not made to be doormats. I think I said one more time. Right, yeah. Women were not made to be doormats, and they are not made to be slaves. All right, all right. There is nothing like a woman with a sweet spirit. Yes, the Bible teaches that she ought to have a, a sweet savor that fills the room, and other folk can see her sweet spirit when she walks in the room. Nah. Women, yes, the Bible says the guy ought to sit in the corner of the rooftop. Uh -huh. And in a house with a contentious woman. Yes. See, God has this thing figured out. And see, men, we can't quote Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, talking about I'm the head and you have to submit unto me because you got to go back to verses 21 and 22 where it says submit one to the other in the fear of the Lord. Yes. Right. Right. Hmm. I think I have more pure rates on my hands than washing dishes than Sister David will ever have. I just thought I'd throw that in there, sister. <laughs> My hands don't get a chance to get smooth. And it's not hard because I'm working hard. It's because I got Purex and Dawn on it. All right. It's because if you're going to make it together, young man and young woman, you're going to have to walk together, be on one accord, and then stop talking about this is mine and this is yours. Ain't none of it yours. It all belongs to God. And God has made you steward to make sure that you walk down the road together. Hallelujah. Okay, you're tired of me now, so. But you have to renew your mind. Prove, have, uh, prove and show yourself an example. What is good and acceptable and complete or perfect will of the Lord? God wants you to be complete in Him. He wants you to be whole in Him. You think that you need a man, a boy, a girl to be whole, but in order for you to be whole, you need Jesus. Stop, stop telling folks, stop asking folks, do, do you have this, do you have a house, do you have a car, you need to be whole, do you have a man, do you have a child? None of that makes you whole. Those things fulfill you to a certain degree. The only thing that makes you whole is Jesus. You can ask the woman at the well, the woman at the well, she had six men in her background. 
And Jesus said, the joke that you got at home doesn't even belong to you. And the Bible says that Jesus told her all about herself. In other words, he, he told her he was all in her Kool-Aid. He told her all about herself. And she left. She was only fulfilled when she met Jesus and Jesus delivered her. So stop putting your hope in stuff. And stop letting stuff sidetrack you. And stop letting folks disappoint you. And see, people will always tell you what you need and what you ought to have. And when you look at them, they're worse off than you are. Look around here, listen to other girls that ain't got, don't have a man. Say, girl, I wouldn't put up with that. Well, I know you wouldn't, but you not me. All right, all right. Guys, talking about man, man, she's using you. She doesn't need you. Well, I've been used the last 23 years really good. <laughs> and don't have a problem with it, Brother Miles. It's all right, it's all right. Because when I leave here, I want God to say, servant, well done. My good and faithful servant. All this stuff here, I'm going to leave it here. And when I get to heaven, I'm not going to even have a wife anyway. I won't need a wife simply because I'm going to sign with the shining of the Lord when I get on the other side. Every day will be hallelujah. Every day will be hallelujah. Every day will be Sunday. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Thank God. I just got to play my role down here. So when I get on the other side, I can rejoice. Brothers, play your role well. Sister, play your role well. He says, for I say unto you, through the grace given to you, through the grace given to me, to everyone, I'm saying to everyone among you, think not himself more highly than you ought to think. He says, whatever you do, make sure you don't think you somebody that you're not. Let me, let me tell you how stupid I was growing up as a teenager. I, I, I was stupid. Uneducated. In college. Uneducated with the world. See, we grew up in church, so the things of the world we didn't know. William Clark had a, had a, a 1980 Ford, all white. White, white all the way on the inside, white on the in, outside. And, and then during that season, we had the white walls on. We were in college, and... and and we would ride down through the city. We would play this song. When we come down through the city, I want to ride, ride the white horse. Now, here we are. We, we are church boys. <laughs> so today, we were in church. We were in Sunday school. And we ride down through the middle of town on Gary Road, that long road that stretches through the middle of town. And playing this song, I want to ride. I want to ride the white horse. We think we, we, we are jamming because we're riding in a white car. We were full grown and on our own before we realized that the white horse was cocaine. And we we playing this song right now through town talking about, I want to ride. And then when people hear us coming, they already know who we are. And they hear us coming, they start dancing on the sidewalk. Now the folks out there know what's going on. There's the folks in here that didn't know what was going on. That's how it is with church boys and church girls. We have no business conforming to the things of this world because we it just won't fit us. And it just won't. We can get out there, we get sucked up. We can get out there and they, they create a disaster for us. I mean, when you get out there and you're a church person, man, I learned some stuff. When I came to Houston, I was like, good God Almighty, I better run back to the church house because I can't survive out here. You can't survive. If you're growing up in church, you can't survive in this world. He said, don't think yourself more highly than you ought to think. All right. He said, don't think, even there some people, they get a dime more than a dollar. And you can't tell them anything. And don't let them get a little education. I mean, they get some education. They want to come back home and tell mama, daddy, and, and big mama all they doing wrong. Because now, now, it was good enough to raise them with no money. It was good enough to send them to school with not anything. It, they went to school on prayer and fasting. But now you're going to come back and tell me where I'm wrong, what I can't do wrong, and what I'm doing right, and what I'm not doing right. Let me just share something with you. You need to understand you think more highly of yourself than God does. All right, all right. This, word, this, word, this word highly means that, that you're overly proud of yourself. You're overly. You just you just so proud of yourself. You just so overly proud. You think you and don't don't let a woman get a new dress. All right. Well, she got she gonna wear it six months. 
she's gonna show it to everybody. She, and she's gonna wonder. She's gonna she's gonna wonder, did I wear it among this group? Or did I wear it among this group? And then, and then she looks around and says, well, I can't wear this on Sunday because somebody was there on Saturday that was going to be at church on Sunday, so I can't wear it there. Let me just share with you. Don't think yourself more highly than you ought to. As a matter of fact, folks are watching you anyway. People don't know what you had on last night at the club because they were boozed up just like you were. Just drag yourself in here after you get out of the club. Come on in here and give your praises unto the Lord and turn it over to Jesus. Yeah. Says, don't think, you think folks so watching you. People have left churches because they, they think people watching them. My, my nephew back home, God bless him, poor boy. I told him he needed to go to Brown Baptist Church. He lived right around the corner from him. And uh, his answer to me was, well, you know, I can't go over there. They booze you over there. And I can't go over there because they're going to be laughing at my car when I drive up. I said to him, you shouldn't put $20,000 in a whole ragged car anyway. You know how boys get those ragged cars and they put all their money into it, fix it up, and then it's still breaking down? I said, I said you, you didn't do... God's resources well. You misuse God's resources. I remember when he took Dad and I to Greenville, Mississippi. We we looking at the car. He gonna go get this bad car. I mean the wires pulled out the dashboard. I mean the, the, the vents don't even get don't even have vents. He got big old holes in the wall. No speaker missing. He wants daddy to invest in that. And that's man, take me home. So his excuse for not going to church. Is that when I go to church, people are going to be laughing at me over there. I said, now, you made a dumb decision to buy a car like that. And people ain't going to laugh at you because when you drive up, the boys and the girls are going to be ooing and on. But what matters is, is that you get to hear the word of the Lord. And people have left churches talking about they looked at me the wrong way. Or the preacher didn't speak to me today. Now, he's only one preacher. He's standing in one place. He can only speak to people who come by. You think he needs to go down the row and speak to every single person in the room? No, that can't happen. The fact of the matter is you're looking for an excuse to tell the Lord, and I've come to the conclusion, if it's good enough for you and the Lord, it's good enough for me. If you can go before the Lord with that, if you can prove that to the Lord, if the Lord can accept, it says good and acceptable gift unto the Lord. If you can prove that the Lord ordained that kind of stupidity, then it's all right with me. All right, all right, all right. We have to get to a point where we understand that we are here for the Lord and not ourselves. So don't think yourself so highly that folk are watching you. Well, I can't wear this wig this time. I wore it last first time. <laughs> And I, I got to have a whole row of makeup because, because this goes better with this dress. This foolishness. <laughs> Women ought to take a, 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 a note out of the men's book. A black suit, yeah. brown suit, gray suit, yeah. blue suit, and then a beige suit. Mm -hmm. And then if I wear the same suit next Sunday, I just make sure I take it to the clinic. And when I let, and when you see it, let me just tell you right now, when you see this jacket next time, it has some black pants on it. Right. It's because we can't get caught up on stuff to prove ourselves to people. How do you know? How do you know, preacher? I'm trying to prove something to somebody else. Let me ask you this. When you wasn't going to work every day, and you were zooming in, or you were you were micro teams in. Are you a video calling or audio calling? What did you have on? <laughs> what, what, what did you, what, what did you, what, one, one company said this, this day, this day, I want you to wear whatever you had on when you were Zooming, wear it to, wear it to work tomorrow. <laughs> we all have seen some of the stuff. It says to me, I don't know if you think that, that far along, it says to me, I've been dressing up every week for somebody else. I've been buying something every week for somebody else. And because I'm not in their presence, I can just put on a, a button-down shirt and everything else can be where I, I, I wear it. <laughs> but you got to stop thinking people are watching you. 
People don't even care. They don't even have time. Things are moving so fast now. They don't care what's going on with you. Matter of fact, they got lot their lives in a bind, and they're trying to get their lives out of bind. They don't have time to watch to see what your lives look like. So I think you, you think somebody really watching you. You think somebody really watching you. Somebody really doing what you. You think somebody really got that kind of time? Oh, you think more of yourself than you ought to. I mean, and, and people, people have actually said, I came to church and when I came to church, I saw that preacher looking at me because of what I had on. Let me tell you this one. I can pass right by you and don't even see you. Because my mind is on the other side of town. And, and, I'm, and I'm guilty. I can walk right past you and when I'm walking, I'm moving. And there's no sense in the cold day calling me saying, you didn't even speak to me today. I said, I, I probably, I'm guilty. Because I don't have you on my mind. I mean, I, I hate to bust your sanctified bubble. I just, I really, I really didn't have you on my mind. I, I looked at she said, well, you look me dead. Now, she didn't say this, okay? <laughs> you looked me dead in my face and you just walked on past me. Yeah, but I didn't look at you. I looked through you. <laughs> and it's, it's only because that we are not that important. The only person we are important to is God himself. We're important to God. God is concerned about our grades in school. God is concerned about how we treat each other. God is concerned about how we govern ourselves from day to day. And he has dealt unto every person a measure of faith. He says, be sober. Be a sound mind. Be sober. Don't be controlled by stuff. Be sober. A lot of marriages are broken up because somebody, one or the other, come home and they're not sober. And when you're not sober, you make crazy decisions. When you're not sober, you're not of a sound mind. And when you're not sober, you're not calm. Are you with me? Practice being calm. Practice calming down. I don't care what you use. You can count to 10 or you can take a breath, whatever you use, but I recommend Jesus. Walk closer with him and you can carry yourself like he carried himself. Deal, deal with Jesus and actually deal with Jesus. Jesus deals with you. And let me tell you, you can cut somebody up and never raise your voice. You can set them straight without even going off. And everybody in the room says, wow, Zoro just walked through here. And you can, you can tell them off and they don't even feel bad about it. But you have to have a calm spirit. You can't be elevated on everything you correct people on. He says, be sober. He says that, that God has given to every man a measure of faith. Why would he say this in this pericope? He says, God has given you a, a measure of faith. God has given you what it needs, what you need to do all these things I mentioned to you. But you got to walk in faith with God. You gotta walk with God. You, you have to walk with God. Life will always throw you a curveball, a fighter. Life will always give you a raw deal. We will make decisions that we will regret. There's no sense in, in just laboring on it. Don't let your present ambush your future. Alright, right. Don't let it, don't let your present. So what? You have a divorce. Move on. So what, you made a bad call, move on. So what, you made an F. Man, when I made my first F in the eighth grade, I thought the world was coming to an end. I was used to taking my stuff home, mama looking at it and rejoicing, and, and my daddy looking at it and said, good boy. I was just so used. And Miss Crickler gave me a F. She gave me an F. She, she shocked my world. So it's a card, I mean. I mean that's I mean I went from an A A A A A A B F. And I went in her office. Went in her room. I said, Did you forget to pull the line out on the right side? <laughs> what what's happening? What's going on here? And it wasn't a final grade. I was just, I mean, a weekly grade, it blew my mind. And I learned in the eighth grade, I learned at that time as a little boy, don't let what I'm going through in my present 
ambush my future. Because whatever we're going through in the present, we have to have faith in God. And God is able to, to blow our future out of the water. He's able to amaze us. Uh, I want to say to married couples, you're going through something right now. These are just growing pain. Don't let what you're going through now ambush your future. All right. You know, children had a hard time doing COVID in school. Don't, don't, don't let that mess you up. Don't. Because oh, something else is coming up later. Yeah. And how you handle your present right. will determine your future. That's right. And you can't say the man holding me back. Yeah. You got to go in there and get it. Right. If a man has ever held anybody back, it's me. All right. And thanks be to God yeah. that I know that God pulled me out right in the presence of the man's face. Right, man. Well, God made the man shake my hand as I became the first one that he tried to flunk and walk down the aisle. God has, has blessed me. And that's why I said, and I've been saying this for 36 years, and I've got to do it. I'm going to write a book called Thank You, Tom. Because it was Tom Patterson in 1984 that rejected me from a job because of the color of my skin. And he pushed me in out of Mississippi into Texas. I came out of here on a two weeks vacation, Sister Darrington, and it's been 36 years. All right, all right. And, and because he allowed three other guys to have the job that I was the only one in the whole plant qualified for, he let three other guys have three jobs that came available at the same time. And I asked him, I said, Mr. Tom Patterson, why wasn't I considered for one of those jobs? He said to me, all 385 pounds of him leaned across his desk, looked me in my eyes and said to me, I hire who I want to and I put him where I want to be. I said, Mr. Tom Patterson, thank you, sir. I went back town. I canceled my vacation from 1984 and carried it over to 1985. January of 1985, I made that 600-mile trip to Houston, Texas, and never looked back. If it had not been for Tom Patterson, I wouldn't even be here. If it had not been for my troubles, I wouldn't have been here. I thank God for Jesus. He went through the trouble for me over 2,000 years ago. Yeah, they took my Lord and your God. They hung him high. They stretched him wide. He died on Calvary. They put him in a bottle of tomb. Out of that Thursday morning, he showed us how to be a champion. He rose from the dead with all power. With all power, heaven and earth, he rose from the dead. So, so make sure you pattern yourself after Jesus. That's right. He's a champion. Yeah, right. Stop comparing yourself to your buddies and yeah. those, your haters. Pattern yourself after Jesus. Mm -hmm. They thought they had him. Yeah. They killed him. Yeah. But he rose from the dead. Yeah. The door of the church is open. Amen. The invitation is extended. God has offered us evidence of transformation. You can be changed today. You can be delivered today. You can be anointed today. The door is open. Will you come? Come just as you are. The door is open. Will you come? Let him in today. Let him in. Let him in today. You can transform your brand new star. Let him in. You can turn your life. Yes, all these things can be. If you just. The door is open.
Christ as your personal Savior, this is your moment. Will you just bow your head with me and invite him in, believing that Jesus died and rose again. Repeat after me, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank God. If you want to join the New Beginning Church, you can do so. If you're listening live, you can do so by inboxing us and letting us know you want to join and become a member of the New Beginning Church. We're glad to welcome you. We're glad to, to be a sister and brother to you in Christ. If you've received Jesus Christ on this broadcast, please inbox us and let us know. We'll be glad. We'll be glad to welcome you to the family of faith. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our service. Thank you so much for being here. It is now offering time. It is time for tithes offering and sacrifice in here. It is offering time. If you need an envelope, please raise your hand and you will be served. If you need an envelope, please raise your hand and you will be served. As we prepare to give today, we want to give to WE. WE, we is Women Empowerment Training Institute. This is a group that sponsors scholarship and they sponsor scholarships for some of our children. And so now we want to give back to WE. So please, ma'am, please, sir, Sister Whitlock. Can you sit that basket out of the north side of the cross for you? You can take everything else out of it. We, we give money and scholarships to children, and they also have funded many of these children that you see playing music. Uh, from time to time, they give money to, to organizations and churches. So today, we want to give to we. Please, ma'am, please, sir, dig deep because uh, they've been very kind to other people and to us. Uh, uh, you've seen here in the last two months that they've been giving every month to the children of this church. And so if you would, give to we. If you, you can give, please give in the basket that's sitting on the side of the cross. We want to give to we. And those of you who will give electronically, go ahead and give by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. If you're giving to WE, you want to put there WE, W-E-T-I, W-E-T-I. You want to make sure that you set your offering aside for WE and also give tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. Father God, we thank you for this privilege of giving. We thank you for money. We thank you for increase. We thank you for income. We thank you for blessing us, Father God, to give back to you. Lord, we know you you love cheerful givers. We ask you to bless us to give cheerfully and not grudgingly. We pray, Father God, to bless every giver. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Bless him. Bless him. Bless him. I want to ask this side to stand. Bless his holy name. And follow first impressions from the rear to the front. Bring forth the Lord's tithes, offering, and sacrifice against Oh, my soul. In all. In all that is. Bless him. Bless him. Bless him. Bless him. Bless him. Bless him. Bless his holy. His holy name. Well, it's this time to stand. Follow first impression from the rear to the front. Bring forward the Lord's tired dogs in this time. Bless him, bless him, bless him.
everything, everything. Everything that is within you. Bless him. Bless his holy name. Holy name. Father God, we thank you now for these gifts. In Jesus' name. One thing our visitors will come. If you're visiting with us, please stand. If you're visiting with us, we want to know who you are. Say hello to us and let that kind of care known. Yes, sir. How y'all doing? All right. Amen. Amen. <laughs> sister Sister the uh, Wayland, say hello to us, please. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for being being a part of our service. Please fill out our business card. I want to talk to you about your experience here today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Our prayer list is listed here today. We want to lift these people in prayer. We want to make sure that we remember them in prayer. Let's pray with me now. Father God, we thank you, Lord. We honor you. God, we praise you. We thank you for who you are. We have a list of prayer. For prayer, Father God, we ask you to bless them. Heal those who are suffering from illness. Heal those that are confused in mind. Heal those who are bereaved. Lord, strengthen their physical, their mental, and their spiritual lives. Bless them, Father God, that they will walk with you and honor you. Lord, we ask you to bless them that they don't let their present condition sabotage their futures. Bless them, Father God, to walk with you in such a way that they are living sacrifices for others to see. And Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We ask you to keep it low. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Thank God. I want to thank you. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Those of us who have joined by online, thank you for being a part of our service. Thank you so much for being a part of our service. Amen.